All right. Um, again, I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the president of the American branch of the International Law Association. And to provide today's welcome, it is my great pleasure to introduce Matthew Diller, the Dean of Fordham Law School, which is the long time host of International Law Weekend. Dean Diller is a prominent scholar of social welfare law and policy, and he is one of the longest serving deans in the law in the country, having served as Dean of Cardozo Law School from 2009 to 2015, and then here at Fordham since 2015. As a Dean colleague for the past 10 years, I can tell you that Matthew is one of the most respected and admired deans in the country, and Fordham is very lucky to have him as its leader. And we are lucky to have Fordham as our partner. Matthew. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And you should introduce me more often. Um, so let me, yes, so my role is limited here. And so I will try and uh, be concise. Welcome. It's fantastic to see you all here. And I'm very, very uh, pleased and honored that International Law Weekend gathers here uh, every year uh, since 2009. So this is our 13th year of um, hosting International uh, Law Weekend. Uh, I was up in Connecticut uh, in September uh, in the area around the mouth of the Connecticut River where every year in the fall there's a murmuration, which is, you know, a giant gathering of swallows um, of thousands come from all over. So I feel this is the murmuration of uh, international law and I'm just excited that you are doing it here uh, and with us. Uh, I won't be long because I know that this is quite the moment to be gathered to talk about uh, international law with major world conflicts, um, Ukraine, Russia, uh, Israel, uh, Gaza and Palestine, um, Sudan, um, our, our Armenia, Ethiopia, Myanmar, I mean, the list goes on and on. It's hard to think of a more fraught moment uh, since the end of the Cold War. Um, you can, you know better than I, the failures and uh, role of international, I was gonna say failures and successes um, of international law in dealing with all of these conflicts and the challenges that they pose. But, but the fallout of these conflicts and other things ripples through the world in ways that have major implications as well, including large numbers of refugees, displaced people, um, tons of migration uh, that poses challenges, the impacts of climate change, food crises, um, in addition, which also causes displacement, also front and center, at the same time as rising nationalism, um, uh, illiberal democracy, populism around the world. You all have your hands full and your work cut out. Uh, as you heard from uh, Michael, I'm, I'm not an international law scholar. And, uh, and so I leave it to all of you to puzzle this through. Uh, I did want to say a word uh, about Fordham Law's commitment to international law, which runs deep and for many, many years and for a long time. Um, it's only natural for us being right here in, uh, in the middle of New York City, uh, and, uh, and it's an area that we've really focused on. So I am uh, just want to do a major shout out to the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice, which is our um, a, a prime gathering place at our school uh, and a vehicle for us uh, to project out into the out, outer wor outside world uh, all of our contributions around international law. I want to thank Liz Wickery, whom I know is uh, speaking on the program, and uh, Liz is the executive director of the Leitner Center, does an incredible job, uh, and also has been our point person in uh, working with International Law Weekend for many years. I want to thank my colleague Martin Flaherty, who has been on the organizing committee, as well as many of my other faculty colleagues over the years. Um, we have um, uh, one of the leading journals in international law, our Fordham Law International Law Journal. We have major clinics uh, dealing in international law, an international human rights clinic, a corporate social responsibility clinic, a global anti-racism clinic, and now an international cooperation clinic. I won't go on. I think you get the idea. Um, all of this makes us, I think, a fitting host uh, for this conference and is one of the reasons why I am excited to have all of you back every year.
I think I'm going to quit there while I'm ahead, hopefully, uh, and uh, let you get on with your program. Uh, I wish you all the best uh, for this weekend and see you next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Diller, and thank you again to Fordham Law School for um, giving us the opportunity to convene here. Uh, I am honored to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker, uh, Gregory Schaefer. For many years, the American branch of the International Law Association has shared a special relationship with the American Society of International Law. And this relationship has been forged by a common understanding, appreciation, and celebration of international law. And today, this special relationship brings us Gregory Schaefer. Professor Schaefer is the Scott Ginsburg Professor of International Law at Georgetown Law Center and the President of the American Society of International Law. He is a noted scholar in international economic law. He recently left UC Irvine for Georgetown Law Center and what is the West Coast's loss is the East Coast's gain. Um, the title of his remarks this afternoon are Beyond International Law, A Dangerous Time. Please join me in welcoming Professor Greg Schaefer. Thank you. I'm so honored to speak at this illustrious occasion in these very trying times. The title of this year's conference, Beyond International Law, is controversial. For what lies beyond international law? Politics? Power? One can view it as depressing for those committed to cite the mission of the American Society of International Law to promote the establishment and maintenance of international relations on the basis of law and justice. One can also see it as a dangerous title and its implications for our future, as well as the violence, turmoil, and chaos besetting the world today in Israel, in Gaza, in Ukraine, and elsewhere. Let's be frank, this is a horrible time. There's trauma from the brutal attacks, deaths, and horror in southern Israel. There's ongoing horror, violence, and deaths of civilians in Gaza, including the most vulnerable, the elderly, children, the sick. There's immense suffering of those close to us and those we do not know but are part of our human family. There's immeasurable grief that is heartbreaking and touches us all wherever we may stand. I wish to start by acknowledging this trauma and asking you to join me for a moment of silence and recognition. I prepared this talk before the attacks and the war and their hemorrhagings broke out. There is no easy segue to this talk. But to carry on, to engage in working for a better world, we must. I see the title of this conference is a call for us to take stock of where we are and imagine propose and implement ways, and I stress the uncertainty in the plural form of ways forward. I'll do so in this talk with a conceptual framework and examples of common challenges, often existential ones, beyond the current war, while I encourage us all to think creatively across all the challenges that this small, complex world and we among its inhabitants face. As Groucho Marx apocryphally is quoted, I'm not crazy about reality, but it's still the only place to get a decent meal. <laughs> As one who works within the legal realist, socio-legal, pragmatist tradition of law, we need to start with reality. In a moment, I will sketch out those traditions and their relevance today in terms of where we might go from here. But within those traditions, I stress, although the understanding of our current situation is contested, 
Striving to understand it is the only responsible way to start. We have been here before. Richard Haas wrote a gripping essay three years ago where he speculated that the times in which we live do not recall the Cold War, which arose after World War II. That time was difficult enough. It was a time where international relations realists took charge of US foreign policy and scoffed at the illusions of liberal international law and the concept of a liberal international legal order. The realists, like Morgenthau, did not forego law, but they turned to an international policy of coexistence, where law was largely an epiphenomenon and thus played no generative role. Their focus was on how to manage the adversarial relationship with the Soviet Union, in which both sides could destroy each other with the push of a button, possibly after misconstruing the other's action. It was a time far from an international law of cooperative problem solving, much less one that supported the liberal norms embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we celebrate on December 10th of this year. I was raised at that time in Ohio. It may have been a Cold War for a young white boy in Cincinnati. It was all but cold for those maimed and killed in the proxy wars between the two ideological adversaries. On the nightly news, we watched Americans die and Vietnamese die and then Cambodians die. To what end? It was a time when the day after student protesters were shot and four killed by Ohio National Guard at Kent State on May 4th, 1970, our sixth grade form teacher entered the classroom and told us they deserved it. They deserved to be killed. It was a time where the US government helped orchestrate coups that overthrew democratically elected governments and supported right wing authoritarian regimes in the name of freedom. Despite their torture chambers and extrajudicial killings. No, Haas was not speaking of that time. Rather, he was speaking of the interwar period beset by economic and geopolitical crises. In Germany, the leading legal thinker was Carl Schmitt. Schmitt theorized law as purely instrumental and political, and he defined politics as an existential struggle between friends and foes, in today's populist terminology, between us and them. That could only be resolved through domination and ultimately killing, and thus potentially a bloodbath. Schmidt theorized law in terms of who decides the exception. Since the exception is always available, law is without normative constraint, and thus the concept of the rule of law is illusory, a mask for the will to power. Schmidt found the exception more interesting than the rule because the rule proves nothing. The exception proves everything. Schmidt's work was influential, not just on the right and embraced by the Nazi regime where he became a party member. It was also influential and remains influential among many on the left. His student, the young Marxist Otto Kirschheimer, who later became a leader of the Frankfurt School, which later heavily influenced the US critical legal studies movement, was Schmidt's admiring student. In his early work, Kirschheimer borrowed from Schmidt to applaud Leninism's pursuit of, quote, a brand of politics that ruthlessly distinguishes friend from foe. The foe needed to be eliminated. For both Schmidt, Schmidt and the early Kirschheimer, liberal democracy was their mutual enemy, reflected in the weakness and indecisive squabbling of Germany's Weimar Republic. <clears throat> 
The answer for both was the purging of the enemy, for Schmidt of the leftists, Jews, and other undesirables, for Kirschheimer of class enemies, the bourgeoisie, and other opponents. Both envisioned a homogenous society, whether it be composed of Aryan Christian nationalists or a unified working class. Such instrumentalism potentially could lead to pacts among the rivals, as it did with the molotov ribbentrop Pact, to ensure the two enemies' dominance over peoples within their respective geographical spheres of influence. That is one take on the theme beyond international law, and the consequences are easy to foresee. Yes, today we are in a different time and place, but we have been here before. Think of the parliamentary cynicism, indecisive squabbling, and threats of government shutdowns of our days. Think of the rise of white Christian nationalists, Hindu nationalists, Chinese nationalists who view the world in terms of us versus them, friend versus foe, of we the people versus the enemy of the people, of political ads with opponents in a sharpshooter's lens. Think of hate spewed on the internet, of the postings of young white supremacists, of the white young white supremacist, supremacist who enters the grocery store with body armor and rapid fire weapons to eliminate the other. The other defined not by whether one has blue eyes or gray eyes, whether one has wavy hair, straight hair, or no hair, or is tall or short, or stocky or thin, but merely on the slight genetic variation affecting the production of melanin and thus the pigmentation of one's skin. Think of the terrorist entering a synagogue or a mosque strapped with explosives or armed with assault weapons and documenting the killing all on GoPro Live. Think of militia training, of death threats against our loved ones. We receive them. Of the active shooter training sessions psychologically scarring our children, our grandchildren, and we as educators prepping us for that random day. Think of the rising economic insecurity and inequality to levels not seen since the interwar period, coming back to Haas, where people hold multiple low-wage jobs and yet still are evicted for not having the cash to pay the rent. Think of the homeless camps, those in tents and those without tents, where, to borrow from Anatole France, the law and its majestic equality forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under the over, under overpasses of our cities. Think of the challenges to science and the popularization of conspiracy theories, of pizza gates and info wars. Even radical postmodernists begin to question the cynical use of distortions, deep fakes, and conspiracy theories that propagate, confuse, sow doubt, reap distrust, and feed hate. These domestic realities are transnationally linked with the challenges besetting international law and institutions today. Those attacking international law and institutions seek to weaken their constraints. They simultaneously attack and undermine domestic institutions, whether in this country or abroad. Take Russia and its war on Ukraine. Russia launched its blitzkrieg in Ukraine, on Ukraine less than one year after Haas wrote his cautioning essay. It did so after poisoning, killing, and otherwise incapacitating domestic opponents through legal charades. This instrumental use of law to dominate, reflected in the phrase rule by law, was brilliantly cap captured in the award-winning Russian film, Leviathan, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend. It takes place um, in a small northern coastal Russian town above the Arctic Circle. There, the law is the Leviathan wielded to destroy any threat to the power holder. To turn to Ukraine, it did not pose an external threat to Mr. Putin's role, but an internal one. 
The threat was its democratization, where Ukrainian activists combated corruption and promoted political and civil freedoms, and the Ukrainian government in turn sought closer political and economic ties with Europe. These ties would facilitate the conveyance of liberal norms which also could seep into Russia, given the historically close cultural, social, ethnic, and linguistic ties of the two countries' peoples. In his televised address announcing Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Putin offered a broad conception of the threats to Russian national security. That paradigmatic exception to international law and all law. Alice Schmidt, Putin, decided on the exception. He blamed the West, not for any imminent military threat, but rather for its ongoing social and cultural attacks on Russia's traditional values, including through imposing attitudes that, to quote the speech, are contrary to human nature. Putin saw the extension of legal rights and cultural acceptance for LGBTQ plus peoples as a threat, as a symbol both of Western cultural decadence and also Western assor assertions of normative hegemony. His challenge to the international legal order and his invasion of Ukraine, in other words, is not just a question of international relations. It is also in no small part endogenous to the internal threats to Mr. Putin's reign through liberalism's normative demands of tolerance, pluralism, and individual, civil, political, and social rights. We face these same challenges here in our own country. And now we live in the midst of a new outbreak of war between Israel and Hamas, the cycles of calls for vengeance reign while Israeli civilians die and Palestinian civilians die and civilians of other places suffer and die. Does not law provide a foundational framework for us to work toward peace and human exchange and better understanding? Are we to think beyond international law? Does not standing for and upholding the requirements of international law offer a better means toward a pathway to peace grounded in the upholding of human dignity? In the United States, a movement arose in response to the traumatic economic and social challenges of the interwar period. It became known as legal realism. I, with others, have written on this development as part of a call for a new legal realism, which is a considerable relevant for international law today. There are many takes on what legal realism means since its proponents were less an organized school than representatives of a common intellectual thrust in response to crises that called for law and policy that were more responsive to social conditions. I foreground here three interacting components of legal realism, pragmatism, empiricism, and experimentalism, in which open inquiry and non-dogmatic response and adaptation from experience are critical. The legal realists were informed by and grounded in pragmatist philosophy, building upon the leading political philosopher of, uh, philosopher of the time, John Dewey. Dewey and other pragmatists depart from postmodernists today in their view of truth. As non-dogmatists operating in a world of uncertainty and flux, they do not put forward a view of truth with a capital T. Like postmodernists today, they learned and built from scientific understandings of relativity and quantum theory. They understood that what we see is shaped by where we stand, and that where we stand affects where we look. They further understood that when we act, we affect what there is to investigate and assess. Facts and acts, cognition, and volition are inextricably in relation with each other. What pragmatists nonetheless stress, however, is the importance of truth seeking and thus of empirical inquiry, the second component that I stress. Legal realism is committed to empirical inquiry and investigation, whether of a qualitative or quantitative bent. For legal realists, law and legal decision-making should be grounded in an empirical understanding of social context. 
If law is to be institutionally responsive, it must build from an understanding of the context in which we are situated. Truth seeking is a process that involves reasoning and deliberation. We strive, however fallibly and however reflexively, to get at right answers. What legal realism opposes is decisionism. The idea that law creates no constraints because the sovereign decides on the exception. In 2012, Tom Ginsburg and I published a piece on the empirical turn in international law. And last year, our society launched a new interest group on international law and social science that builds in the legal realist tradition. And my friend and co-author, Mark Pollack here in the audience is helping to co-chair. Third, given that we live in a world of uncertainty, legal realism stresses the importance of experiment, experimentalism as part of pragmatic problem solving. It stresses the importance of creating institutional structures that can respond to uncertainty and adapt to changing contexts in light of our experience. It calls for us to break down larger problems into smaller ones where we can make meaningful improvements. Legal realism integrates these three different components, pragmatism, empirical investigation, and experimentation with a view toward adaptive problem solving. The Roosevelt administration in which so many legal realists worked exemplified such an approach in response to the onslaughts of the Great Depression with its pronouncements, the administration's pronouncements of the four freedoms. The administration had its failings, as all administrations do, but it took experimental action and response to problems in light of, an exper of, of experience in a world of considerable uncertainty. Finally, let me add two further complementary dimensions to legal realism, a critical and an institutional one. There's an important critical dimension to legal realism because of its views on uncertainty and its advocacy of truth seeking despite inevitable fallibility. Because reality is dynamic and shaped by our actions, and because our perceptions of reality are fallible and shaped by where we stand, legal realism stresses the importance of humility, reasoned deliberation, and democratic exchange. It requires reflexivity about what shapes our perceptions if we are to be open, responsive, and effective. It requires deliberation where we hear the views and perspectives of others, particularly those who are most vulnerable and least likely to be well represented. Social equality is thus a core element of liberty for legal realists so that people have the capacity to pursue their life choices and to participate in broader political and social processes. Critique, however, is not sufficient for legal realists working in a pragmatist tradition. Problem solving requires institutions. And since institutions are highly imperfect, difficult choices must be made, a point to which I shall return shortly. So what are the lessons for international law in terms of where we go today? How might we positively conceive as international lawyers of engagement beyond international law. As a starting point, given the authoritarianism in the 1930s and the horrors of World War II, persuading our fellow citizens of what the past teaches us regarding the importance of international engagement and its relation with domestic policy and, its, and in particular social policy is critical. Out of the ashes of World War II, new international institutions arose and declaratory aspirations proclaimed. But the Cold War almost immediately stymied the process. International law scholars and advocates thus turned to alternative mechanisms that are relevant for this conference's theme of beyond international law. I turn first to the concept of transnational law and problem solving mechanisms as developed by Philip Jessup in, 19, in the 1950s. Jessup wrote of the concept of tr transnational law as problem solving 
during the Cold War where hope in public international law and public international institutions had withered. He had served on the U.S. delegation to both the Bretton Woods Conference in 1943 and also the San Francisco Conference in 1945 that led to the creation of the United Nations. By 1956, however, when he wrote his famous essays, the prospect of international, and in, and international law and international institutions as problem solvers had dimmed. During those polarized times, Jessup himself was attacked and investigated as a communist sympathizer by U.S. Senator Joseph McCarthy during the Red Scare. Jessup turned to analyze other means of fostering international problem solving, which incorporated but went beyond international law. He defined transnational law as all law which regulates actions or events that transcend national frontiers. It includes public international law, private international law, and other rules which do not wholly fit into such standard categories. Jessup's turn to transnationalism is highly relevant to this conference's theme. If international law is viewed solely in terms of the formal sources listed in Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, it clearly is insufficient for responding to today's problems. From a socio-legal perspective, I had developed with others the related concepts of transnational legal ordering and transnational legal orders. This approach focuses on processes that transcend national boundaries and give rise to the transnational construction and understanding of problems and legal responses to these problems. First, one needs to have a common conception of what the problem is before one starts to develop legal norms to address it. Public international law is a tool, whether it assumes binding hard law or non-binding soft law, that is one component of these processes. In many areas, international organizations and transnational networks formulate principles, model laws, guidelines, peer review mechanisms to monitor progress in achieving common ends and to adapt goals and mechanisms in light of our experience. Work on transnational legal ordering assesses both how problems are constructed and understood and how legal norms in response to these problems settle or unsettle at multiple levels of organization, from the international, to the regional, to the national, and most importantly, to the local in terms of local practice. From a legal realist perspective, at the international level, institutions are needed to engage in pragmatic problem solving, grounded in empiricism and experimentalism, and that are adaptive in light of experience. I turn now to the work of Chuck Sable at Columbia Law School who has been collaborating with others to assess different experimental techniques to unsettle gridlocks and holdups so that we can move more effectively to respond to transnational problems such as climate change. His important book, What David Victor, Fixing the Climate, exemplifies this approach. The two build from numerous examples of international coordination and problem solving in different contexts characterized by high uncertainty and significant risks. A transnational experimentalist approach aims to catalyze structured processes of regulatory dialogue that bring together public and private actors at multiple levels of governance. Officials working on distinct issues in particular regulatory fields jointly deliberate over and set regulatory goals and measures to gauge their achievement, while permitting variation in how agencies pursue the attainment of these goals in light of the inevitably varying local context. These agencies commit to report to each other and central bodies regarding regulatory outcomes, and they participate in peer review processes aimed at improvement and potential reassessment of goals in light of experience. This approach involves ongoing mutual scrutiny of outcomes and their effectiveness based on information exchange by regulators committed to regulatory improvement and attentive to risk, including potentially catastrophic risks in many sectors, ranging from pharmaceuticals 
medical devices, food, finance. The development, implementation, and review of, just to give one example, hazard analyses of critical control points, a system to identify and protect against food pathogens, illustrates a systematic transnational approach to reduce and respond to transnational risks. Given variation in local context, implementation ultimately depends on local actors engaged in these local contexts. International law has to come home. In their book, Sable and Victor explain how countries address the depiction, the depletion of the ozone layer through a framework treaty, a treaty, public international law, that catalyzed such an empirically based experimental approach. Both the nature of the problem and feasible solutions to it were beset by incredible uncertainty. This uncertainty required experimental projects from which the parties and industry could learn and develop new technologies and alternatives. An international treaty, the 1985 Vienna Convention, and its follow-up, the 1987 Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer, set forth the necessary framework with broad goals, which were to progressively curtail and eliminate production methods and substances that threaten the Earth's ozone layer. Such solutions would require innovation and the creation of new industries, building from experience which would involve many false starts. The treaty catalyzed the creation of structures that brought together scientists, regulators, and industry to study the problem, develop alternative technologies for production in different economic sectors. The system created a schedule for progress that the parties reviewed and adapted as new knowledge and challenges arose. Problem solving was broken down and addressed contiguously and serially in different sectors. Networks of committees convened users and producers to spur and assess efforts to find concrete, economically feasible, sector-specific solutions. To give just one example, study was required regarding the question of whether a refrigerant that depletes the ozone layer can be replaced by an analogous and more benign alternative. And on the other hand, whether refrigeration systems that utilized these new chemicals can work reliably and at an acceptable cost. Both questions were critical. The process spurred pilot projects that, if successful, could attract larger scale experimentation. Oversight bodies were created to grant exemptions and extended phase out periods and timelines in response to new challenges that arose. The parties created a multilateral fund to build local capacity and provide technologies for developing countries in which local contextualization was needed. Positive and negative incentives were critical in promoting change. Positive inducements through financial and massive technological transfers complemented the threat of trade sanctions for those who did not cooperate. Sable and Victor show how this model is central for tackling the multifaceted problem of climate change. We have a treaty, one now based on the pledging of commitments, as MJ Durkee writes. Such pledging is not formally binding or enforceable. It exemplifies a type of mechanism that goes beyond traditional public international law. It is critical in providing a coordinating device one which can inspire national action and help spur and support domestic actors who press domestically for further national action. Yet what will be required is to go beyond the treaty and the ensuing pledges and to break down the problem of climate change into all its myriad complex components and to enable and support networks that bring together regulators, industry, scientists, civil society, to address challenges within particular sectors. The treaty provides an overarching collective goal and thus an essential legitimating mission. But most work will occur outside of it, whether by clubs of nations, 
or individual national and subnational governments working with industry, scientists, and civil society who reference it and its goals. Some success has already been attained in some sectors in what Dan Bedancy calls a micro transnational legal order, and that international standards and practices settle transnationally with the aim of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in that sector. But so much more is needed to address this overarching problem. To turn to the institutional component of legal realism, there is no single institutional alternative to addressing global challenges in a pluralist world, and thus comparative institutional analysis is required. Such analysis accepts that there is no institutional nirvana, but rather a choice among highly imperfect institutions that involve different trade-offs. For legal realists, these choices should be made and adapted in light of experience as empirically assessed. One institutional alternative is where a lead regulator takes action that catalyzes market responses affecting private actors and regulators transnationally. Paul Steffen's book, The World Crisis and International Law, highlights how in a polarized world, these types of transnational processes can provide potential advances. Take, for example, California's creation of emission standards, how they affect industry production decisions to assess, to access California's huge market, and how the standards eventually diffuse, including transnationally. Take another example of combating corruption that affects all nations. Rachel Brewster documented how the U.S. first enacted a statute, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, in 1977. But there were no prosecutions under that act for almost two decades. There were no prosecutions under it because it was deemed to be, there was pushback against it by foreign governments who did not want their corporations prosecuted under U.S. statute and by U.S. corporations who felt that it'd be an unlevel playing field if they had to not engage in corruption while their foreign counterparts did. What this led to, though, this first national statute led eventually to the OECD creating a, a, the Anti-Bribery Convention in 1997 that went into effect in 1999. After 1999, prosecutions significantly increased because the international treaty legitimized the national statute. It includes a peer review process that helps to monitor compliance and create pressure for enforcement. It legitimated U.S. enforcement against foreign companies as well as national ones so that U.S. companies would no longer be disadvantaged and U.S. enforcement dramatically increased. The principle of combating corruption further spread to other treaties, regional and global, and including the 2003 UN Convention Against Corruption, which now, last I saw, has 189 parties. The European Union is at the forefront of regulatory norm making that engages transnational processes. Take EU rules on data privacy, chemicals, and climate change. One of my first articles as a junior scholar, when I was just starting, was on the mechanism through which the US data privacy rules would have transnational impacts. In her later important book, The Brussels Effect, a new Bradford here at Columbia, New York, illustrates how and the conditions under which the European Union more generally has been a regulatory entrepreneur and its response to problems within the EU, but problems that are global and that have transnational implications. To return to the challenge of climate change, on October 1, 2023, the EU's carbon border adjusted mechanism known as CBAM went into effect, raising both international controversy and promise. Developing countries in particular are concerned about its impact on their trade and development prospects. Yet they too are threatened by climate change and their citizens generally are more vulnerable than those in wealthier countries. They are right that technology transfers and financial assistance 
and large quantities are required for a just transition. Positive incentives must be combined, however, with negative ones. And hopefully, CBAM and responses to it will help catalyze them in more effective ways. As part of a dynamic transnational process, the EU legislation can help spur domestic action abroad so that norms and mechanisms to effectuate them spread. For example, Vietnam announced just back in September its development of a carbon tax. China will likely expand its emissions trading system. I haven't read the news today, but the US and EU are negotiating a resolution with respect to tariffs on steel and aluminum uh, to try to address greenhouse gases. These processes, in other words, are dynamic. They need to be seen in that vein as part of transnational legal ordering that incorporates but goes beyond international law. They could fail, and if they do, we will face systemic existential consequences. But engaging in these transnational tools and these processes that both incorporate and go beyond international law is the point. I conclude with words from the philosopher Kwame Anthony Apia. He writes, as populist demagogues around the world exploit the churn of economic discontent, the danger is that the politics of engagement could give way to the politics of withdrawal. Forgetting that we are all citizens of the world, a small, warming, intensely vulnerable world would be a reckless relaxation of vigilance. Elsewhere, Appiah writes, has never been more important. Engaging collaboratively and transnationally with elsewhere is essential if we are to address the challenges of our time. We have been here before. International law and transnational legal ordering have never been in greater need. Thinking beyond international law does not signify its abandonment. We must rather integrate international law as part of broader transnational processes so that we pragmatically and cooperatively enhance our understanding of problems and effectively address them. I applaud the organizers of this conference here in the heart of New York City, across just seven avenues from the United Nations for convening us to deliberate over how to think beyond international law in order to address more effectively the common but differentiated challenges that confront us. We live in uncertain, dangerous times. We must learn from what we don't know. How? The central way to do so is through pragmatic engagement in problem solving, involving transnational cooperative structures and experimental action and empirical analysis that dynamically and recursively interact. In that way, we may adapt our understandings and practices to address the different challenges that we face. To channel Yogi Berra, an icon of this great city, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, and be particularly because the future ain't what it used to be. As a player, Berra knew uncertainty. As thinkers and actors, we must develop ways to respond cooperatively and effectively to uncertainty, working through and beyond international law. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh
We have time for just one or two questions. We want to be mindful of the, uh, the schedule. And so we're, um, Professor Schaefer is happy to answer any questions. Let me ask. Yes. Thank you very much for bringing up Kwame Anki and Afia and public politics in general. To what extent are we in need of going beyond international law to the extent of supranational, cosmopolitan law? Not just transnational legal ordering, but something above and beyond nations which will call for the need for world citizenship and indeed global government. Yes. It goes straight to my point of institutional trade offs, right? There's dangers with respect to supranational uh, uh, institutions because they're so distant from the citizen, they're so distant from the local context. And given the way power plays out in the world, there are real risks with that. Um, the European Union, of course, is the most far along, uh, but there's been lots of pushback within the European Union, especially given the financial crisis, the euro crisis, and the European Union's responses to it, which had dire effects, especially in Southern Europe. And so we have to think about that in terms of, I, my own view is we need supranational international structures, but they have to be very attuned. It can't dominate, right? They have to be adaptive, and so much depends on what happens at the local level. And there are obviously so many advantages to addressing local problems at the local level, but we should be able to learn from each other we should, it could, because we face common problems. And in this small planet and everything about it, unless it, climate change is the clearest example, right, that unless we create structures to try to solve these problems local, at multiple levels of governance, we're doomed. Yes. Hi, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for bringing attention to the acknowledging the trauma faced by the Palestinian people. Um, I really do appreciate you bringing that up uh, as it has been something that has been ignored for decades. Um, and I think it's still a little bit new to all the legal conferences and the legal community, so it's something that I've been really looking for to know. I wanted to ask you, uh, in your professional opinion, I was hoping to hear a little bit more about specific international law violations um, that we're seeing, because there's a lot of speak, uh, a lot of people are speaking about, you know, just violations on both sides and specific to the Palestine and Israel conflict that's happening. Um, however, we're not hearing exactly what type of violations that we're talking about. And I was able to actually see a statement that you made at the American Society of International <coughs> which talked about which discussed this. And my question to you in your professional opinion, why do you believe that your own, your exact words in the statement, part of it was that you urge all states and international community to condemn international law violations and to do it aggressively. My question is why does this urgency only come up when we've seen a loss of life on the Israeli side, which of course no loss of life, I will say, is ever okay. Um, but why is it that we only see these statements being released in this anger and this aggressiveness when this is happening? Why haven't we seen statements from the American Society of International Law over the last 80 years when Palestine has been occupied and these lines and international violations have been happening uh, for this entire time, uh, specifically with the United Nations as well, when you have Israel that has violated more United Nations resolutions than the entire world combined. Why have we not seen any <coughs> that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's it's obviously I'm not going to be able to respond to your, your provocative question in minutes, but I welcome to actually talk with you afterwards. Um, so you know, one cannot make statements about everything, otherwise, we'd be making multiple statements every day. Um, and so in the, the history of the American society, actually very few statements were made. Um, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Obviously given this, and so there were not, the, the society actually, this is a presidential statement. So it's actually my personal statement as president. It wasn't a statement of the society itself. There's a completely different process for that. And so it's really then a question in terms of my presidency, why did I make this statement, right? And I'd be glad to talk to you about it. I stand by my statement. But in the statement, it called for all parties, right? Um, and both 
Israel and Hamas to comply with international law. And for me, as an international lawyer of president of an association which represent which mission is to promote the maintenance of international relations on the basis of international law, it seemed that was appropriate to make. Um, but your question, I think, is about timing of the statement. Um, but let's continue afterwards. I, I think we need to go. Let, let's talk about it afterwards, because I, I've only been a president for a year. I've made three statements. Um, and so, but we should talk. Yeah, yeah. Or, well, I didn't need to. Right, I actually purposefully tried to make that statement and to raise it and to raise it here too. But you asked a different question, um, which is the timing of different statements, right? And I, in my own view, the timing was an appropriate one to make a statement as opposed to be silent. Um, I thought it was very important to do, and that's the reason why I did it. Of course, any statement that anybody makes is going to be subject to criticism from any different side. But I felt that I tried to make a statement that was focused on international law um, and that applied to everyone and that expressed uh, sort of solidarity with all victims. <laughs> of whatever ethnicity, nationality those victims may be. Um, and then to stress the importance of international law to try to get to a just peace. Thank you. There are plenty of other panels this afternoon and continuing on tomorrow. So we hope to see yeah. you and uh, take care. Have a great rest yeah. of your afternoon. Yeah. Yeah.